Well, we're studying the book of Daniel. Pastor Josh is leading us down through, oh, <laughs> I, guess, I don't know how that got in there. Alexi, did you do that? Uh, we had a great time at Ferguson's Orchards with some of our senior citizens this week, and we even hired a professional bus driver to drive that bus for us. So, uh, Dennis, thank you. Somebody made a comment on Facebook about that this week, that at least they put all of the naughty kids in the back of the bus. <laughs> so thanks very much for that comment. Do you have more, Alexi? That's the only one? Okay, Ruthie, thank you. I appreciate you. <laughs> uh, let's go to Daniel. Uh, and Josh's theme for all of this study of the first uh, six chapters of Daniel is how do we take a stand in our modern culture? How do we stand for Christ? And today, we have a specific uh, theme of the first 30 verses of Daniel chapter 2, where how do we take a stand in the midst of a threatening culture? A threatening culture. How many of you have ever, and, and just think about the worst experience you've ever had being threatened? You don't have to stand up and talk about it. I'm going to tell you mine. There were two. The first one happened when I was a junior in high school at Johnson High School in St. Paul, great big school. It was Christmas break, and there was a hockey tournament being held at the St. Paul Civic Center downtown. And so as a junior, I had my license, and I had my dad's car available to me, so I took my two brothers. We drove to downtown St. Paul, parked in a parking ramp, and we went into the St. Paul Civic Center, watched the game, and on the way out, I said, let's take this alley. It's a shortcut to the parking ramp. And halfway down the alley, we were confronted by four men, young people, who knows, I, I, they were maybe still high school or college, but they were all carrying knives. And there were like six of us walking through that alley together, and they confronted us with the knives, and they held us up against the wall. We stood with our hands up like this, backed up against the wall, and they said, do you guys know any Christmas carols? And I, all of a sudden, a little bit of the threat level went down, even though they were still holding the knives. And all they did was make us sing a couple of Christmas carols to them, and then they let us go. What a weird way to threaten people. <clears throat> I don't know. I felt, though, initially, when we saw those guys coming at us with the knives in the, ad, in the alley, that's a terrible feeling. That's a threatening feeling. Years later, on my <clears throat> third or fourth trip to the Philippines, when the uh, communist Muslim terrorists were at their highest peak on the island of Mindanao, I remember as we traveled one place to get to some of our churches over there, I remember traveling through one area where the, the men from the Bible college told me, now on this trip today, um, you're going to get extremely hot and you're going to get very sweaty and it's going to be a difficult situation for you. And when I got in the van for us to travel, they made me lie down on the floor of the van underneath one of the seats and they covered me with a tarp for a four-hour journey. Because they said, if your face is seen through the window of our van, we will all be kidnapped and probably killed. I've been in those threatening situations. And I, I laid on the floor of that van, and I, I can honestly tell you that I never once feared for my life. My life is in the hands of Jesus Christ, and what he determines is what is going to happen. I feared more for what my wife would do and what my family would do. How many of you received the email a newsletter this week from Travis Barton with More Rejoicing Ministries, and you read. He was just kidnapped in Mexico and held captive. And he took it as a complete opportunity to share every opportunity that he had. All he did was open his mouth and tell those men about Christ. 
And they held him captive for an extended period of time. And finally, they took him back blindfolded to a place he didn't know where they were going. And they ended up at the church where he was supposed to be ministering. And they dropped him off and they said, we're really sorry, we apologize. We should never have taken you. The power of God in the midst of threats. So in the book of Daniel, chapter 2, we're introduced to a king whose name is Nebuchadnezzar. And in the early days of his, minist- of his reign in Nebuchadnezzar, in Babylon rather, which started in about 605, 604 B.C. and extended all the way until he died in about 563 B.C., King Nebuchadnezzar was known for his, his, his power and his authority and that he could get done whatever he wanted to get done. Nebuchadnezzar was a conqueror. He had started out under his father, the king, whose name I can't pronounce, and uh, he had started out with doing some of the battles down into the nation of, uh, all the way down into Judah. He was defeated by the Egyptians down there initially, went back and he focused on capturing Syria, and then in a later campaign, he moved down into Judah again, and that's when the kingdom of Israel was taken captive in 586 B.C., And Nebuchadnezzar had been king already for about 15 or 20 years. And Nebuchadnezzar was not held in high regard by other nations. He was called Nebuchadnezzar the Great, but that's only because they feared him. But I want you to get two things out of this morning from what we're going to study in principles in this chapter. I want you to get two primary things key points. Number one, that God will give us the ability, like he will give Daniel in this situation, he will give us the the ability to stand up for him no matter how severe the threats. That we do not have to give in to the cultural impact that's trying to be forced upon us that Christianity is the problem with this nation. We do not have to give in to that. We can, in the authority of Jesus Christ, stand strong and proclaim the truth even when we are being threatened with whatever it is that they will use to threaten you. Job loss, family loss, death. It doesn't matter. But there's a second thing I want you to notice in the book of Daniel. We don't get to see the result of it yet. Pastor Josh will deal with that next week in the second half of Daniel chapter 2, and then later on in Daniel chapter 5. Here's the second point. God isn't done working on anybody. Even when I can't see him, he's working. Even when I can't feel it, he's working. Do you understand that God never stops working on anybody? Daniel's whole purpose for being held captive in the nation of Babylon, his whole purpose can be summed up in one thing. Bring Nebuchadnezzar to faith in God. Because God's never done working on anybody. And Nebuchadnezzar ends up in chapter 5 of Daniel becoming a full-fledged follower of Almighty God and declaring his majesty. And I'm afraid as God's people, we've got a list of people that we've given up on. And I want you to know God never does. He never gives up on anyone. So let's dive into the story. I'm not going to read all 30 verses. We're just going to talk about it. Here's Nebuchadnezzar in the first couple of verses of chapter 2. And Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And he is very deeply troubled by this dream. So troubled, in fact, that he he couldn't sleep for nights and nights and nights and nights. Could not sleep. So afraid to go back to sleep because he might see that again. And so he calls together all of his false worshipers in his country, all of the false gods. Nebuchadnezzar's name, in fact, means uh, O Nabor. 
Nebuchadnezzar, Nebu, O neighbor, which was one of their gods in Babylon, their chief god, O neighbor, take care of my children. That's what Kadnezer basically means. O God, take care of my children. And yet Nebuchadnezzar had no understanding of the one true God. And he had this dream that drove him crazy, and he called in all of his counselors, magicians and sorcerers, and the Chaldeans who were known for their wisdom in the spirit world. And he summoned them. <clears throat> and he makes a request to them. He doesn't just simply say, hey, tell me what my dream means. He said, tell me my dream and then tell me what it means. Anybody here want to volunteer for that job? Tell me what I dreamed last night. Anybody? No? Because you don't know. You don't have no way of knowing. And then to make sure they understood the importance of this, he threatened them with their lives. He said, look, if you can't tell me, I'm going to tear you limb from limb, and I'm going to do the same to your family, and I'm going to lay your whole house in ruins. Talk about a threat. How would you like to stand before someone with an impossible task that's given the sentence of death if you can't accomplish it? And that's exactly what he did. And they tried to negotiate with him. They said, there's not a man alive who can do this. Who can tell you? And Nebuchadnezzar was so out of his mind at this point. He said, I don't care. I don't care. You're going to die if you can't tell me what my dream was and then tell me what it means. 